Tell me, my dear friends, have you been good little boys and girls this year? Have you? Come on, you can tell me the truth. Well, I certainly hope you have, and the Santa's going to pay you all a visit very soon. Because if not, you might just be getting a present from somewhere else. Fantastic story for you this evening, from one of my very favourite authors, Derek Hawk, otherwise known as Killer Hawk One. Now, if you're familiar with the other stories I've done of his, you know you're in for a real treat this evening. So, sit back and relax with your favourite Christmas drink. Because it's time to listen. Perpetual darkness lingered at the top of the world. Thick ice, frigid air, and snow covered the lifeless mountainscape as far as the eyes could see. Despite this all, the endless night did not go unchallenged. A single source of light illuminated the sky and drove back the darkness. Nestled between two snow-covered mountains, a little cottage sat with puffy, billowing smoke rising from its chimney. Ignoring the fact that the nearest civilization was thousands of miles away, to the casual eye, the house was simply a warm and welcoming home. Still, one might ask themselves, what an odd thing to find in such a bleak place. How could such a thing come to be? Like most things found in the North Pole, not everything is as it appears. The land was unforgiving and cruel, and could take your life within minutes. Only a select number of creatures were given permission to live in this harsh and relentless wilderness. All others who entered this domain did it of their own accord, such as the residents of this tiny little home. However, these individuals had fortune on their side, and they were like no other. With a lot of love and just a little bit of magic at their disposal, they lived happy and joyful lives. At first glance, it would appear it was nothing more than a simple, ordinary home inhabited by elderly people who loved each other dearly. If this were your conclusion, you would be partially correct. In reality, a magical secret existed below, for the small house was much more than meets the eye. The warm and cosy cottage was not just a home, but the tip of a mystical workshop hidden beneath the ice. For centuries, children around the world found joy from the efforts of the hidden workshop. All year round, tiny magical hands toiled and labored to create toys and playthings for all the good children of the world. Elves, the last of the magical creatures from old, dwelt within its walls and used their mystical nature to create wondrous and joyful things for Christmas morning. Two days after the winter solstice, the old man would put on his heavy coat and boots, take to the air and deliver his Christmas joy to every last child. Like everything in the cosmos, there must be a balance. For every night, there must be a day. Every beginning has an end. And with every kind child, there was a naughty little boy or girl to be found. Far below the bright lights, singing, and happy elves creating and building new and fantastic toys, there was another workshop. There, the warmth of the hearthstones could not reach. While the purpose of the upper workshop was to bring happiness, the other was dark and sterile. It too had a purpose. It was here where the masses of cheap and easily broken toys were made. There was no love put into these objects. Never would a child's eyes brighten with wonder and awe upon seeing these gifts on Christmas morning. In his wisdom, the old man knew that even a naughty child should not be forgotten during this time of goodwill. However, the old man was no fool, and had no desire to waste his resources on such unsatisfying tasks. 
The responsibility was handed to the banished and exiled elves that inhabited the deepest bowels below the workshop. Those with selfish hearts and greedy desires. Stripped of their immortality, they wasted away in the dark with only the trinkets and flimsy materials to pass the time. Ergra Eta sat in the poorly lit corner of a tattered workbench. His focus was entirely devoted to the old and worn piece of brass in his hands. The clangs of his hammer hitting metal rang out and echoed through the dark halls and passageways. He pounded the brass sheet relentlessly, until the metal slowly began to surrender its shape and bend to Ergra's design. Suddenly, the hammer flew out of the mad elf's grasp. He examined his limp hand, trying to will it back into his control. Fury filled his heart as he watched the necrotic flesh sloughed off his bony hand. Yes, he didn't have much time. His other hand was weak, but still capable of grasp. He reached into his toolbox and removed a long, warped nail and stabbed it into the back of his paralyzed hand. He pushed on the nail head until its tip broke through the skin and emerged through his palm. Immediately, the pain surged and shot up his arm. The thick and rigid tendons loosened within his hand, giving him temporary use of his digits once more. The elf picked up his hammer and resumed molding the shape of the brass plate. With each impact on the brass, he poured his rage into his creation. How ironic that the product of his tireless work was meant for the ones he hated the most. His deteriorating body was fading fast. He possessed just enough magic to fuel the curse he would cast upon the object. When finished, his gift would be placed with the other junk toys and cheap trinkets. He would make its way to them and find a child on Christmas morning. The curse will take hold and slowly begin tearing apart their lives. It will channel their essence back to him and reignite his immortality. The object would pass from one child, then to another, century after century. Yes. Yeah. He had just enough magic left to evoke his curse. Ergra had once lived and worked above. Like any other elf before him, he loved nothing more than to create beautiful and wondrous toys and gizmos. However, in his heart, he wished he could keep some of his creations for himself. One day, his eyes fell upon a beautiful music box his friend Dalela had created. The music box was extraordinary, meant as a gift to a king's firstborn. It was magnificent. Crafted from oak wood, it bore an elaborate gold design on each of its sides. When opened, a figurine of two children, opening their gifts under a Christmas tree, spun to a lovely melody. Ergra Eta had never desired anything more in his entire life. It filled his heart with jealousy. He became resentful that this precious and rare treasure would go to an undeserving human infant. A little girl didn't deserve it. It should go to him, he thought. So, under cover of darkness, Ergra slipped into the work area and took the music box. Unable to sleep and anxious to put the finishing touches on his prized creation, Delayla decided to return to the workshop. To his surprise and shock, he caught the elf attempting to steal the special box. Delayla was enraged, for greed and thievery amongst elves were extremely offensive and not tolerated. Ergra begged his friend not to report his transgression, but Delayla was unmoved by the pleas, and turned to tell the others of Ergra's crime. Desperate, Ergra did the only thing left for him to do. He grabbed a hammer 
and brought it down on his friend's head over and over again, until no more life remained in the broken body. Despite his meticulous efforts to conceal his crime, he could not escape the sight and wisdom of the old man. Humiliated and dishonored, the elf was banished from the workshop and his precious music box was taken from him and given to the little princess. Stripped of his immortality, Ergra Etar was cast into the cold and dark corridors of the other workshop to spend his remaining days, never to create a beautiful thing again. As the seasons passed, his hatred for all children grew and ate away at his sanity. He gritted his teeth, knowing that the children of man were given everything, and he had nothing. Hunched over his work, Ergra feverishly worked to complete his masterpiece. He stared down at the anvil and hammered down on the brass. Each strike brought the faces of a child into his mind. It lives in war. The blunt hammer formed the metal into a hollow cylinder. It stuffs his face with sweets and treats. Stumpy legs were welded into place. It gets everything it asks from mommy and daddy. A malformed head and crooked ears took shape. It gets anything. The brass surface was scrubbed of debris and grime. It gets everything. Small turquoise stones were glued to the brass body. I hate it. One glimmering red ruby stone was glued onto the left side of the figurine's head. I hate it. The second red ruby was then fixed onto the right. I Hate them all. In the glow of the fire, Ergra held up the brass figurine. It was a disturbing representation of a rabbit. Its body was a lattice of criss-crossed brass strips, bejeweled with a pale blue turquoise stone at each intersection. Its head was malformed and gave the impression of a dead thing instead of a pleasant rabbit full of life. He placed the atrocious thing upon an open silver locket that contained a mirror on each of the hinged inner sides. With the rabbit figurine facing one of the mirrors, he carefully opened a vial that held a clear liquid. It was lymph from the elves. The lymph was the source of magic that flowed through their bodies like that of blood from the second set of unique arteries. The magic lymph had its own circulatory system and heart. It was the vital system that gave the elf their magical abilities. Only a few tiny drops fell out of the vial. It splashed onto the figurine and mirrored locket, illuminating them with a golden glow. Ergra closed his eyes and spoke the words of Wormwood in his elven tongue. The clear liquid turned black and stained the surface of both a rabbit statuette and silver locket. The glow turned a deep purple, then slowly faded. Pleased with the outcome, he gently placed a cloth over the object to obscure it from sight, and ever so carefully placed it in a small box, decorated with holiday cheer. Finished with his work, Ergra turned to leave, pushing past the corpses of several elves hanging upside down from the support beams of the other workshop. Their lifeless bodies drained completely of every last drop of magical lymph. Ergra's calculation had been correct. He had just enough magic to fuel the curse placed on the object. The Mad Elf smiled and began to laugh. For the first time in a very long time, Ergra Etar's heart filled with anticipation at the approach of Christmas morning. The little girl sat in a large pile of torn wrapping paper from the many gifts she found under the Christmas tree. On the morning of December 22nd, 
Gabby awoke earlier than anyone else. She went downstairs and glared at the many presents that continuously tempted her. It was as if they teased and mocked her every time she looked at the colourful, beautiful wrapping paper. She would receive such a terrible scolding from her parents, but she couldn't wait any longer. At first, it would only be one gift she opened. Then it became two, then another, and another. Before she knew it, all of her presents had been opened. Despite getting everything she asked for, the desire for more was still not satisfied. When Gabby stood, a small gift next to the base of the Christmas tree caught her eye. She could have sworn it hadn't been there before. The wrapping paper was worn and yellowed with age, written in big words with a tag that said, To Gabriella. It was like no other, and she surely would have seen it before now. Puzzled, she removed the wrapping paper and found a box that contained a smaller, sealed box and a scroll. She opened the scroll and read, Congratulations, lucky one. You are the proud owner of Pepe the Rabbit. Pepe loves you and will be your best friend in the whole world. Pepe is a friend like no other, and he will give you everything your heart desires. To be Pepe's friend, you must listen to him and never disobey the following instructions. 1. Place Pepe on his locket facing the mirror. 2. Never look Pepe in the eyes. He is ever so bashful and only likes to see you through his mirror. 3. You may ask anything of Pepe three times. In three days' time, he will grant any and all you asked of him. Number four. Never look Pepe in the eyes. Yes, it bears repeating. He does not like it and he will be upset if you disobey this rule. Remember, lucky little boy or girl, Pepe loves you. He loves you more than anyone else in the whole wide world. Pepe will make sure that no one will hurt you ever again. And if you love Pepe, you will listen to him and do whatever he asks of you. Pepe loves you, and no one can ever come between you and him. Pepe loves you. Sneaky little story that one, wasn't it? Did Pepe get away with it? What's gonna happen to that poor little girl? <gasps> oh, so much to think about. <laughs> well, you all have a safe, happy, lovely, warm Christmas. I'll be back again very, very soon. Till then, bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?
love myths, urban legends, paranormal stories, and chronicles of unexplainable mysteries and phenomena. As a kid, I actively sought books and articles on the topic, no matter how vaguely related. Twenty years on, I still enjoy delving into the stories of the unknown. The difference being, twenty years ago, I didn't have access to the wonderful World Wide Web. These days, I literally have a world full of myths, legends, and stories at my fingertips. And so, I often indulge in long Googling sessions, dedicated to absorbing as much information as I can. I am intrigued by the unknown. It means that there are things yet to be discovered and mysteries to be solved. It was during one of my many mystery binges I came across the story of the Hat Man, a form of shadow person. I stumbled across the legend of the shadow people completely by accident, clicking through random links on Wikipedia. But it was the related article about the Hat Man which piqued my interest greatly. It roused a long dormant memory from within the depths of my mind. The following is an account of my encounter with what I now believe to be the Hat Man. I don't recall how old I was, around four or five, but it must have been quite late at night. My parents had retired for the night and the house was completely dark. The only source of light was the gentle wash of moonlight filtering through the thin curtains into my room. I was lying on the top bunk of the bunk bed my dad had made for us. The bottom bunk was occupied by my younger sister, who had been sleeping soundly for hours. It was nearly Christmas, and I was laying awake, pondering the complexities of the world something that has become a bit of a habit over the years. Although it was likely the huge intricacies I was trying to figure out in my mind had something to do with how long it was until Christmas on that particular night. As I was staring at the ceiling, completely merged in my own thoughts, I suddenly became aware of a feeling spreading through my body. A chill went up the back of my neck, making my hair stand on end. If I'd been close to falling asleep, I was wide awake now. I held my breath and laid stone still, straining to hear something which would give me a clue as to what it was that had put me on edge so suddenly. I heard nothing other than my sister's rhythmic, deep breathing from the bed below. When I could hold my breath no longer, I let it go as quietly as I possibly could. I couldn't hear anything out of the ordinary, so after a few more minutes of laying as still as possible, I decided to roll onto my side so I could see out of the bedroom door into the hallway. I did this in such a way that it would seem to anyone looking in on me as though I was rolling over in my sleep just in case one of my parents came in and gave me an earful for not being asleep as I was supposed to be. As I completed my expert maneuver, I heard a noise in the hallway. It sounded like footsteps, which was a relief. It was just my dad checking on something in the house. But as the footsteps drew nearer to my bedroom door, a wave of unease washed over me again. My dad was always very careful about being as quiet as possible when walking around after lights out, so as not to wake anyone. Listening to this particular set of footsteps, I wondered if perhaps this was my mum, as the perpetrator seemed to be making no attempts to mask their sounds. I pondered this curiosity 
as a figure emerged from the hallway and came to a stop in the doorway of my bedroom. Once again, I found myself holding my breath, trying to be as still as possible. The figure stood in the doorway, breathing quite loudly. It was definitely a man, judging by the sound of the breathing. For a few moments, I relaxed, thinking that it was my dad after all. I started breathing again and closed my eyes, pretending to be asleep. But the sound of the breathing stayed in the doorway. I opened my eyes again and took in the image before me. My blood ran cold. My dad did not habitually linger in doorways. Also, my dad was nowhere near as tall as the doorframe, nor did he wear, or even own, a wide-brimmed hat. I stayed as still as I could, hoping that the figure could not see that I was awake. With that monologue running through my mind, I was reminded of the line from the Christmas Carol. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. I smiled to myself. The figure in the doorway was Santa Claus, and he was waiting for me to fall asleep. <laughs> of course, it made sense being so close to Christmas. I closed my eyes once more, ready to fall asleep. Once more, I got that feeling of unease. The hairs on my neck stood on end once again. Something was not quite fitting about that conclusion. Santa doesn't wear a wide-brimmed hat. Also, I was fairly certain that he's never depicted as tall and broad-shouldered. The figure in the doorway definitely did not look, or feel, very Santa-ish at all. My eyes shot open again. I needed to figure out who was standing in the doorway. Even with the light filtering in through the curtains, I could not make out any details of the figure. My eyes had adjusted fairly well to the darkness by now, and I could make out just about everything around this figure. But whoever was standing in the doorway may as well have been a shadow. The only thing that told me that this was not a shadow was the heavy breathing accompanying the figure. Just as I felt that I could not lay still any longer, the shadowy figure took one last deep breath and receded from the doorway, seeming to melt away into nothingness. By this stage, a lot of kids would probably have cried out for their parents or, at the very least, thrown their covers over their heads. I did neither of these things. Instead, I laid there, pondering my new mystery of the night, Christmas forgotten until I fell asleep. I remember asking both of my parents the next day whether they'd spent any time looking in on my sister and me the night before. They assured me every time that I probed them about it that they had not been anywhere near my bedroom the previous night. I guess, after a while, I just sort of shrugged it off. It didn't happen again at all. Every now and then, the memory would spring to mind, especially during my nighttime ponderings. However, I thought about it less and less as time went on, until I saw the picture accompanying the Wikipedia article on the Hat Man. I'd almost forgotten about it completely. To this day, I have no idea what it was. Whether it was one of my parents sleepwalking, somebody who wasn't meant to be in the house, a supernatural being, or otherwise. But the picture of the hat man is almost exactly what I remember in my doorway. <laughs>